Why is there no video? There it is, there's the video. Nice, nice to see you all. I hope you're having a lovely afternoon. Let me just make sure that oh. you can all hear me. Yes, you can all hear me, that's great. Yeah, nice, welcome to live stream. Um, so before we begin, I shall start with advertisements, which is very important. Um, the main way in which you can connect with me is through my book clubs. At the moment, there's no classes, but there will most probably be one coming up in the next couple of weeks. So you can um, subscribe to the waiting list by going on to the page on my website of book clubs and ask to be informed when they go live. There's only six people in each class. Um, so it's very intimate. It goes on for 10 weeks. And we start off for the first 25 minutes-ish doing a check-in. So everyone speaks about how their week's been, about what's been happening for them with awakening or non-duality. And then we study the book for about an hour, a bit over an hour. Um, we read bits and then um, I comment. And if anyone has any commentary or questions, then they can ask. And it's really beautiful. At the moment, I'm studying with people, I am that and Papa G's Wake Up and Roar. And I enjoyed both of them immensely. So you're welcome to join. Um, there is also a retreat in the south of Europe, a walking retreat in October. However, if there isn't enough participants signed up by the 1st of June, there has to be a certain amount of participants, then I'm gonna cancel it. So if you are thinking about signing up, make sure you sign up now. There's also not that many single rooms. So if you are thinking you were gonna do it, but there was no rush, then um, yeah, then it's best to sign up now because otherwise I will cancel it in the first week or two of June. Um, so that's in the south of Europe. And then we're also doing an hour and a half walking and an hour of yoga a day, as well as two talks. Um, one hour and a half talk from me, one hour talk, and then some meditation, maybe an hour or 45 minutes. I forget how long the meditation is. And in all of these, like the quality in which I think I bring to the book club and to the retreats is just like blasting everyone with nothing. So it's not so much about intellectual clarity or exchanging ideas or talking about your problems or your, your seeking patterns. It's really being in satsang, in truth, in that nothing, in that nothingness. And it's not really me blasting you with nothing, it's just nothing is emanating. It's like the subject is spoken about and then it emanates in the room. Yes. So if you'd like to join, please sign up now. We're now April, obviously. So we've got about a month and a half, two months left. If you want to ask questions, you can join the Telegram group. Find that out on my website. Um, and you can also sit in Zoom now with me. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask in like live speaking, then you can put your hand up in Zoom um, and I'll answer it when I'm ready. Um, but be aware that your video won't be streamed, your name won't be streamed, but your voice will be streamed. Yes. So, yes, that is actually, um, you can also in the Telegram questions group, the written one, you can ask questions in advance or you can ask questions on the day and I will answer them. So yeah, you can write them the week before or during the week when you think them and just bomb the group with the questions and then I will go through it when I'm um, ready.
Yeah, that is all I think. Yeah, and also if you appreciate um, this video, then please make sure you like, subscribe, and if you feel like it, comment on the video. Um, it all supports the channel. So um, yeah, I'd so appreciate that if you did it, if you do that. Um, yeah, I so love sharing non-duality and um, yeah, and this really helps me to be able to do that and share that on YouTube. Yes. Even if it's just a thumbs up comment you make, that's so appreciated, it makes a difference. Okay, that is all. Now we will go to the title. Remind myself of what the title is. I hope this week that it's not making that glitching sound I practiced, but you know what these things are like. Last week it was making a glitching sound. What does it feel like to awaken spiritually? Great question. So, yeah. So first of all, before I answer that question, I'm first going to um, talk about what non-duality is. So what awakening is for me to what, and then I will talk about what it's like. So what's amazing about non-duality is there can be a feeling of getting non-duality and then a feeling of forgetting non-duality. Because the biggest mistake, which is so hard to see and is seen by no one, is that non-duality is a thought or an idea. So you can understand non-duality and speak the words in a more fluent and efficient way than I or other teachers. But yet there might not be the true, true knowing, which is not verbal. This is why so many different teachers can speak about it in a different way, because it's not a teaching, it's not words, it's not something that you learn. What I really feel that satsang is, for me, <laughs> I say for me because I'm trying to not make it like, this is the way it is. I'm trying to, you know, get a bit away from this um, dogmatic way of teaching, you know, that this, this is the correct way. I am the teacher. I know all. 
So I try to say for me to encourage others to find their own interpretation of this. Um, but for me, what satsang is, which the meaning is meeting is in truth, is actually being in stillness together. which isn't a mental concept. It's um, a movement back to the stillness of what we are in every moment. This immense presence that's here, that's always been. We could call it consciousness or beingness. But as long as that's also recognized as not a thing and all things simultaneously, that they're not a thing. So, Satsang isn't actually verbal. It's almost like the verbal is like a slide. It's like the one that's speaking attempts their best to describe what non-duality is. And from doing that, it's like um, contagious. The ex someone expressing what non-duality is, it slides the others into non-duality, or it is an invitation to non-duality. Because actually, sometimes what it can do is, is really evoke the, e the ego or the separation as well, that could, it can become very present. And this is why I think that most people are listening to non-duality repetitively, not really because of the words, because that can be learned quite quickly. It's to do with the satsang, the meeting in silence. It's like a meditation. And words have relevance, they do certain things. It's not that we can be talking about Mickey Mouse, although, it's, it's more that there is a focus, you know, by the words, there is like a commitment to non-duality, to that which is beyond. It's like those words are committing to this. And yeah, it could be done through talking about Mickey Mouse or Double Dutch, but then it's like everyone would have to be committed Everyone would have to be free in that, if you see what I mean, because you're committing without actually speaking about it. Whereas the spoken words is like the commitment and then the energy in which the words are spoken from is like the slide into that abyss, the unknown. Well, it's not about me or a teacher presenting it in different ways or giving you ideas to understand yourself better, although that's so super helpful and I'm not against that. I'm sure I've done that, given ideas in which to work with your separation or, yeah. Yeah. Um, ways to look at certain things, but it's really um, not that. It's the commitment, which is the expression of non-duality, one person expressing it. And then it's like a song calling. And with something about it, you know, that using these 
more extreme words of non-duality for me when I express that evokes the nothing more. And what happens when I express currently is the more that I go into people's story, um, it's like there's less of a resonance there. So you might have noticed after, over the last few years, I've begun to go back more to just pointing. And it's because I'm just following that resonance. You know, there was a period in which I had to be speaking more about the story. And now that's fading again. And the nothingness is like, no, nope, this is what's got to be spoken. Or the stillness. No, nope, this is what's got to be sp spoken. So, um, what's really amazing, being a speaker and communicating this for now nearly 13 freaking years, my goodness, it'll soon be 23 years, eh? Um, so, what is it's happening after 13 years, as I can see how people seemingly go in and out of that nothingness, but they're not really recognizing what's happening. So the way my teacher explained it to me is that when there's less identification happening, there is more of a sense of expansion and freedom. You're not bound by anything. There is a sense of expansion which comes with an emptiness, a freedom. There's not a bumping up against life. And when you're really identified, then there is a contract contraction and everything feels like it's bumping up against you. And when I'm speaking about non-duality, I notice now from this side, people, it's like they open and then they close, but they don't really realize that's happening. And they think when they're opening, they're doing something right. And when they're closing, they're doing something wrong or the world is doing something wrong and they're not really registering it correctly. They think it's because of something in time, like I feel more happy now because I've been meditating or I feel more happy now because I've done this and I feel more unhappy now because of this and because of that. Whereas actually the truth is, is you feel more happy because there's less identification. You feel less happy because there's more identification. And there does seemingly seem to be things that can be done to affect that, but um, but it's not somebody's doing. It's not somebody that can manufacture manufacture it. So you can listen to a talk, and there can be a resonance to it, and there's more than likely there will be uh, an expansion than say if you're watching a horror film, but one never knows. There's always exceptions. This world is a world of infinite possibilities. So there's always exceptions to the rule. Nothing ever fits. Yeah. Um. So what it feels like to awaken is expansion. 
And I know that gives the mind food for thought, but it's the end of feeling like you are a character that is experiencing and a movement to this emptiness or this consciousness, which is all places and no places or the beingness, which is no places and all places. It's not the end of the character. There is definitely a need for a character in order to experience life. So it's not the character that goes. It's the end of that character being the experiencer and a movement back to who you truly are, which is no thing and everything. This emptiness which is experiencing itself. And it is love as well. So what it feels like to spiritually awaken, even though this is a story, this isn't truth. Um, it's only truth when it happens. It's like a story that you're imagining now, like a me as opposed to what I'll be when I awaken, is expansion and love, intimacy. The end of feeling contracted inside the body, that your body is your edge and that that is who you are, that is the experiencer. And then there is a knowing of who you are, which is nothing, no thing, emptiness appearing as all forms. And the closest to it in this life is the beingness and the consciousness, the empty looking and the sense of I am. So it's being deeply rooted in the consciousness and the I am. And the consciousness is empty and the I am is love and all things. So it's no longer somebody that's moving the body. It's consciousness speaking, I am speaking, but not I am somebody, you could call it beingness speaking and moving. And that is directly felt in every moment. But not as a thought, not as an idea, not as something you can recall, even though I'm recalling it to you now. It is an expression. Oh, pardon me. Oh, pardon me. It is an expression. And this to me is what you call what I call freedom. But please note other teachers might not necessarily call that awakening, spiritual awakening. Um, they might have a different definition of it. Um, so this is just my definition. It's not the fixed definition. Ramesh Balsaka used to say, enlightenment isn't a certifiable event. Yeah. You know, three people could think that they're all describing the taste of watermelon, but maybe one's describing the taste of a strawberry, one watermelon, and one red meat. And they're all like, yeah, yeah, this watermelon, but, you know, it's not. It's, um, yeah, personal journey, which isn't personal. It's almost as well like a loss of control. Like in every action, it's God's action, it's life actions. 
It's not a person. It's not narcissistic or arrogant. Like this is God speaking. I am God. It's like a humility, an absolute humility. The life is being acted. And that my, my Lisa character isn't perfect. So that's another part. And I end up making me sound really bad on YouTube because I go too far, you know. I want to articulate and express it isn't about being a perfect character. I want no deception here about me being godly, the Lisa character. Ultimately, everything is God, so it's godly. But Lisa makes mistakes. Lisa can be inappropriate. She can be angry. She can be grumpy. She can be hormonal. She can be everything. She can be happy. She can be joyful. She can be light. There was a profound change in my character. And every life became a lot easier and a lot more in flow. Um, and the thinking became reduced for me, my character. And there was like a connection to happiness, like even in all moments, even when I'm really sad or grieving or something. There's a connect, like there's a feeling of happiness in the human level, um, or a feeling of relaxation, or even maybe bliss. But um, but I still can have all array of emotions, really all I think, except hatred, and um, that's a big word. So. The hatred is defined of, by the belief in doership, the belief that the other or I do, and then the belief that life or objects or thing will bring, things will bring me freedom. And that to me is hatred. When that is believed in, then the intensity of the seeking and the person you know, will go to any lengths to get what it wants. And hatred doesn't mean anger, like, um, you know, I've, over th 12 years now of being on YouTube and working, being seen as a powerful woman by men, which is difficult in our society, um, you know, experiencing different relationships. And it's not the end of anger, there's been anger with people, like humans including myself, I'm a human, can be so difficult and crazy sometimes, um, and frustration. But then humans also can be awe-inspiring and brilliant and enlightening as well. I get lost in the trees here. Like I, I face my computer now to the window when I'm doing the live stream because it's um, you know, summertime, so it's light. And it's more of a natural light than a spotlight. Um, I get lost in the trees, the movement of the trees, in the birds going in and out, in the blue sky and the moving clouds. So what it's like to spiritually awaken, to me, is freedom. On the human level, though, 
it's a conscious it's continuous expansion into that oneness like so my human character and the expression of that oneness through the human character continuously expands because nothing in the flow of things is is fixed everything in the flow of things is always changing but from the um from the perspective of who you truly are that doesn't change so when that's awoken when there's a remembering of that like a real remembering of that or an energetic shift that that doesn't change because that is changeless who you are is changeless but what does change is the expression of that through the human like i would say over the last like 13 years you know there's been old hidden traumas coming up in Lisa, old seeking patterns, things that weren't understood, like all of that just kept expanding, that the characters just kept wanting to align more and more with truth, not through an idea, like I, on the human level, would have no idea really how to do that, but it's just there's a natural movement to investigate, and then life brings in things that rub against the character, making the character explore and investigate that. So on the human level, it's like maybe when the awakenings happen, then the human level is absolutely committed to expanding more to oneness. With It's got no choice. It just will naturally do that. Yeah. So right now, it feels like everything is vibrating with nothingness. It's like um, it's like speaking about this feels like the nothingness just becomes so strong. Like um, so vivid. And that's, that's what I feel like as a teacher, that's what my quality is. Like all different teachers have different qualities. And I really recommend, you know, seeing, listening to different teachers to give you a broad range of this subject. But I think after 13 years nearly of teaching, I can confidently say that that is my quality. Is that. Boom! The boom of silence. Yeah, that's what I should um, call a talk. The boom of silence. No, that's a bit stupid. No. Okay, so we go to questions. So if you want to raise your hand in Zoom to ask a question verbally to me, um, then you are so welcome. And you can also send a question in Telegram, a written question. Good. Yeah. No one in Zoom is raising hands. So if you join Zoom, I won't share your video. And if I accidentally do, I will take the video down. But I've got it on focus mode, so I won't share. So I won't share the video and um, just your voice. And I'm trying not to say people's name. In the Telegram group, though, you're really welcome to change your name, but not your Telegram ID.
So, hi Lisa, I understand there is no separation between I and the world, but when we say things like the world is mad, or when we witness cruelty, are we really seeing aspects of ourselves? Thank you for the question. Yeah, this is actually a confusing question. So you're not seeing aspects of yourself on the character level. I mean, this is really confusing because everything in a way is an interpretation of the brain. So the way in which we see light, the way in which we see others is an interpretation through, of, through the brain. And whether that actually exists or not is an unknowable it could all be a um, projection inside our brain we could be in a hologram who knows what's happening so that's um a really hard line but that's not whose dream it is there isn't a you that is dreaming this dream who you are is the experiencer, which isn't the character. So when you say, are we seeing aspects of ourselves? Although I'm saying that everything is projection of the brain, who is the one that's projecting the brain and who are you inside of the brain? So you've got to go deeper than that and see that who you are is beyond the brain. Who you are is this emptiness. Watching itself as everything. Experiencing itself as everything. And it's so intimate, there is no dist distance between the emptiness and all the things the experiencing and all the things. It's all one in the end, like a dream at night. It's all rejection of your brain. Um, this dream is all a projection, I suppose, of oneness. Yeah, but this is a really intense question because then it comes back to, you know, what is karma? And this is all mystery, you know? how this all unfolds. And it's not so much, I don't think, about getting the answer. It's more of a surrender to it, you know. So if bad things happen, is it because it's the karma of this character or thoughts that this character have had? Or is this character creating it in a way? No, because the, the brain, the character isn't the creator. But it seems that there is a mystery there. You know, everything is interlinked. But at the same time, you know, if your family will die in a car crash, did you create it or is it your fault or is that an aspect of yourself? I think that that's going down a terrain of self-punishment that isn't necessary. It happened and its reason for happening is mystery. Why that happened is that an aspect of yourself? Is that teaching you something? All of that is mystery and will never be solved. You're never going to be able to stick your flag in and be like, oh, I understand life. You're going to be able to go deeper and deeper and have better understandings. But you'll never be able to stick your flag in and get it. Your freedom comes from moving back to that which you are as freedom. What love, what love that is, and compassion. Yeah, this, re this really is total unconditioned love, this message. And just for all those new to the channel, that doesn't mean my message. I am a speaker of non-duality that has been taught for thousands and thousands of years. And it's not my message, it's just this body is one of the messengers of it. 
It's life's message. So I, the Lisa character has no claim of it and is just as in awe of this message as the others. Not Lisa's message, but it's in non-duality. So it's like letting go of these types of things. Everything on the human level can be used as grace, can be used to go deeper into the human experience. So say if all the family is killed in a car crash, that can be used, the pain of it, the, the grief of it can be used to help go deeper into the human experience. Like everything is a teaching in a way taken in the right light. Thank you for your question. Hi, Lisa. New to Telegram and just making sure you get questions here. Yes, you're doing a good job. You can and you can write at any time time. What is happening with the change when I am in a car? I seem to get a different view for a split second. I can't explain it. Yeah, driving driving a car is a phenomenal experience. A phenomenal experience. Because there are quite a few things happening. One is that, I don't know if you've noticed this, but you can't drive a car. You can't be like, I mean, the character can't be the one in control because it's all happening too fast. Like if you ever try to, like, drive your car well for me if my character tries to drive the car it screws up and what I mean by that is like so say for example I I grew up in um, the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom drives on the opposite side to most of the world but not all of the world it did have colonies in which they also drive on the other side of the road but most of Europe drives the opposite side, which is its closest companion, and uh, America, which is quite close. Yeah. So if a UK person ever wants to travel, if it's not to say India or Australia, or maybe some other places in the world, I'm not sure, but I know those two drive the same side as England, then we have to adjust our brains. And when I first started doing it, at first I was like, I can't do this. This is impossible. But then when I first did it, the person that taught me was like, just don't think about it. Just follow the car ahead. And even like having the gear stick on the other side, if I don't think about it and I don't think, okay, where's the brake? Where's the accelerator? Or which side should I be on? The, the only thing that I hold in my head is that um, you know, I need to be in the middle of the road if I'm on a, in a European car, mainland European car. But everything else, I just, like, don't think about it and it happens. And it's really amazing. And sometimes my hand tries to grab the door handle rather than the gear change or the gear shift. I'm not sure what you guys call it. In England, we call it the gear stick. Um, so sometimes my hand tries to dry, grab the door handle, but it just corrects itself. Like even then, if that happens, I 
Just don't think about it and just let the body find its way. The same as what we do with walking, you know. If you ever try to like walk really careful, you, you often like mess it up. But if you just like look and let the feet find their way, it happens. And, um, and so when you're driving, and it's the same with playing music or doing art, it was the same when I used to act as well. You know, it's happening so quickly acting. But if there's thought about it, you often screw it up. So you just there's just a presence to it. And um and and so and when you're you know you're going really fast and there's trucks and lorries and cars and cars going really fast and different entrances and exits. I don't know if anyone's driven in par in the center of Paris before. You know, this is quite an accomplishment. I think there's like one roundabout in Paris where you, you're not insured. It's really hard to get insurance to go around this roundabout in Paris. You just kind of go in and it's just massive. It's just massive. There's like 10 possible lanes. It has no markings on the ground. And you so sometimes I'm just like, just go around it until I manage to get to my exit. Just keep going around. It kind of works. Yeah. So there's something, and then you've got this like space and distance. Like when I'm driving, like in the Pyrenees or the mini, mini Pyrenees or the Alps or, you know, wherever it is, the mountains or the Lake District. Yeah, I think it's Lake District. The Highlands. It's just um, your perspective, your view is so altered. You know, you're looking, you're driving this car and then there's this immense space and you're sort of going down hills. I don't know if other people get this. And it's so wide and spacious. And you can't really think about what's happening. You're totally dependent on your body doing it. And then the motion in your body is like you're going really fast. But at the same time, you're sitting still in your car. Like the body is sitting still. But yet the car is going fast. You know, there's all these like contradictions that are happening. And... And so things like that, and dry, cycling on the bike, you know, doing the scooter, it really can um, force a kind of presence because our kind of immediacy, because it's harder for you energetically to relate a sense of self here and a world out there because it's like there's so much changing. Do, do you know what I mean? So it can challenge your sense of center. That's what I think. It's the same, yeah, with flying, most probably. Uh, um, yeah. So these things are phenomenal practices, and we really take it for granted. We're like, oh, I've got to drive to work every day for an hour. But it's like a meditation for an hour. It's like a full out funky chicken dance meditation where you're sitting perfectly still in a car that's moving fast with all this scenery going past and all different types of views and angles and distances. You know, and your body is functioning and moving the gear stick and the pedals. And who are you? you know, everything is an opportunity. Everything is grace. Everything is singing here, 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 here. Well, the car is a really funky one. So every time you're in the car, you can see it as a phenomenal meditation. You know, if we put people from 100 years ago in a car or an airplane, it will blow their freaking mind. But... Um, the nature of humanity is sometimes to become really um,
you become really uh, um, complacent about the um, nature of experiencing and the awe and wonder of experiencing. This life is awe-inspiring. You know, all of it, we just take it for so, oh, this is mundane, I've done it so many times. And if you come back to the moment, without your thoughts, without your interpretations, it's awe-inspiring. There is a tree for no reason. There is a pavement for no reason. There is looking for no reason. There is sky for no reason. It's all mystery and it's infinite possibilities. It could be anything. We're so, we've become so used to looking at it through logic and then that becomes our suffering. This is logical. Logical. Is it really logical? Is it really logical? Yeah, thank you for your question. This is the same person. Sorry, I read somewhere this is for questions before Zoom and I can do Zoom because of time in Australia. We'll find another way to chat with you. But I know something has happened. No, this is perfect. You can write this anytime if you're in Australia. You can write it during your day. Anytime during the week, you can put, put questions in the question group. It's just um, not so much for chatting because then all the questions get lost. Like if you want to chat to someone, you can just send them a personal message, maybe. I don't know if that's appropriate, but I don't know how the rules of Telegram work. But um, yeah, it's just the chatting then makes it hard to see questions. But uh, so can you do talks at a different time for time zones? Well, sometimes I do it at different times. So keep posted to the channel um, in Telegram, you know, that channel page. And then sometimes I do it earlier in, in the morning um, for... Um, other reasons, but that would be more appropriate for you, I presume. I tend to do it at 4.30 German time or French time or, yeah, um, every week because then it's like a sense of regularity. But that isn't a given, you know, sometimes I can't do it then. But they are all recorded. So you can, you know, write your question and then... Uh, I can answer it. Hi, Lisa. Do you think that the law of opposites is true? For example, sociopaths are a reaction to saints or vice versa. Or for example, on a similar personal level, no matter what behavior a person acts out, the opposite behavior or marriage image also exists at some level in the same character. I don't know how this world works and how it all works. I don't believe that um, it works in the same character. Sometimes, you know, prior to investigation of self, some woman can be, somebody can be acting really nice because they've got a deep, dark shadow of hatred. So they're pretending on the surface to be really nice, but you poke them a little and like, <laughs> comes out. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. This happened with this person recently who's so sweet and so timid. And um, I blocked her in one day with the car. And um, yeah, I just, I just forgot and uh, blocked her in like maybe 10 15 minutes but she still could have got out but i was in her way but and uh yeah. it 
Yeah. So, and, and normally she's like a mouse. So that can happen, but I don't think that's a rule because I think someone can be, you know, really worked on all their shadow stuff, have had awakenings and really feel love and not have the opposite of hate inside them. So, yeah. I don't know how the world works. If there's one nice person, there'll be one evil person. I think all of these things are good to reflect on to break our current ideas, but then I think holding on to any idea tends to be a massive limitation. A wise person knows nothing. Could you speak again about decisions, the big responsibility that the character feels in creating its life? Yeah. So the truth is, is that every action is simply happening. Like the tree now is blooming. The character is speaking. The character is doing or acting. The illusion comes with, I am acting. So it's like the tree saying, I am growing, I am blooming. But because we've got these voices in our head, like something interesting has been happening recently in my body. So as I age, um, I, I now begin to experience weather differently. I don't know if it will go back to the way it was. And because I've lived in cold countries the majority of my life, um, I now experience sometimes hot flashes or getting hotter, you know, like I, my body temperature is hotter. And with the hot flashes, what's really interesting is that I know prior to them coming. So it's so, it's so funny. I don't know if other women get, get that, like, it's not like I begin to feel the tingling of them. It's like a good, before any sensation of them start, I know one's going to start. So it's a really funny thing. And so like what I'm pointing to is that our thoughts and our narration about situations aren't accurately timed. So it's like the, the body is beginning to go into the mode of a hot flash. So we call them a warm flash, a hot flash, or beginning to heat up. Um, and sometimes it just happens because the sun is, you know, my body's just more hotter. The sun comes in through the window and it's just a more of a hotter body now. And, um, and, um, Yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, so it was just quite like, our, our, you know, our thoughts aren't in line with the series of actions. But, but the way the thoughts are presented, it's like as if they are. So in that moment, it's almost like by that narrator happening, you know, that's like telling me, thought is telling me, that a hot flash is just is going to happen. Um, you know, it could look like that person is choosing to do it, but if we look physiologically, we know that that's not happening. It's just for some reason, rather than it narrating after it happens, it's narrating before it happens. It's just some bizarre thing that's happening. I don't know why. So what happens in your choice making. So if the thought comes up prior to you wanting to make a tea, I want to make a tea. 
and then the body gets up and makes the tea. But in a way, it's happening in the same way as the hot flash. So it's not really me choosing to have a hot flash. There is the thought that arises and then the hot flash happens. But we know that I'm not choosing. I mean, some people might existentially say I am choosing, like the thoughts are choosing everything, but that's a whole different subject. But it's it's like we know that there's no control over that. I can't I can't stop the body doing a hot flash. Seemingly, some people really far in spirituality might say I could do a breathing exercise to stop it. But just if we just take it that the body is having a chemical reaction which is creating an overheating in the body because there's a dip in hormones because the body is aging, blah, 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 you know. So there's like a physiological thing that's happening, which is creating the body to heat up. And the thought comes, you there is going to be a hot flash. And the hot flash happens. There's a physiological response that happens. So the thought that comes is, I want a cup of tea. And then the body moves and gets a cup of tea. And there is a belief that, I want the cup of tea, that thought is creating the movement to have the cup of tea. But more than likely, the movement to get a cup of tea is already decided, like the movement for my body to have a hot flash is already decided. And then the thought comes up, I want to have a cup of tea, as if somebody is creating the I want to have a cup of tea. But really the thought is coming after the momentum. You understand the analogy? I don't know if I've said it correctly. So it's so fascinating. Like there's such a strong belief in this, I want to make a cup of tea and I am going to choose it. And the reason that happens is survival because with this mechanism and this belief in you doing, um, there is an ability to update the information box and have a particular human experience and when I say the information box it's like through having this I narrative it the I narrative can be used to change and update the um, responses the conditions the habits and the conditions of the body yeah it's fascinating. Eh? So maybe if you go really deep into your experience, you can begin to catch these things out. So prior to any feeling of needing to go to the toilet, there is a thought that comes up and says, you're going to need the toilet in so and so minutes. You know, it sort of debunks what we believe choice making to be. And you have no sense of needing the toilet. And then the sense of the toilet comes on. You could also have it with the doorbell. The doorbell is going to ring soon. And then the doorbell rings. You know, all these things contradict what we think we know about the functioning of this life. But when you believe you are that thinker, the one that says, you know, you're going to have the hot flush, when that believes to be you and the experiencer of this life, then it exacerbates thinking patterns especially this idea of doership. And this is what Roger and Ramesh called hatred. This doer, this belief that that thought is the doer. Whereas that thought is a reaction of immense chemical reactions that are way beyond this I doing. a phenomenal experience it is to be alive. Mind boggling. So your question in every moment is who's doing? Who am I? Who is doing? And notice throughout the day how many times 
actions happening without you telling yourself to do it. And then the mind just bleeps over that. It's like, beep, beep. It just picked up its glasses without instruction. It just picked up its drink without instructions. Like, beep, 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 beep. Ignore, it raise, the raise. And then it focuses on the times like, oh, I fancy a cup of tea now. When a question is asked, is there some sort of a reference you make to how this feels or senses in your body? And if yes, does this relate to the answer provide? I mean, in every moment, what is the body? So when a question is asked, do you feel some reference to your body or sense in your body? There is sensing happening, there is feelings happening, but it's an extra thought to then construct that as my body. You know, what is the difference between a feeling or a sense and the blowing of the tree that's happening in front of me now? Could you please share your insights on the topic of spiritual bypassing? Yeah, thank you. I don't know technically what everybody means when they speak about spiritual bypassing. Um, so it's only down to me, you know, like I'm not sure what other people mean by it. So, um, Moving back to stillness isn't excluding the body and the feelings. So it's not excluding it, it's not pushing it away in any way. Um, you know, stillness embraces everything. It's a person that pushes away the feelings. So spiritual bypassing would be, to me, trying to go to stillness to push away the feelings rather than being in stillness and the feelings arising as they arise and the thoughts arising as they arise. So spiritually bypassing would be that to me, trying to go into my, no mind to avoid the feelings that are appearing. Another layer, but this is more superficial, would be of spiritual bypassing, is trying to manipulate relationships through stillness by trying to avoid confrontation, you know, issues in relationship. So this can often occur in relationships is that two people are in a disagreement about something and then one person starts sprouting, you know, stillness or non-duality rather than being truthful about what's being felt it's another way of spiritually bypassing you know so there's a disagreement about washing up and then one person says you know you've got to equally wash up that's what's fair or let's discuss what's washing up and the person that doesn't want to do the washing up might reply of like the body can only do what the body does. There is nobody doing. And if washing up doesn't happen, that's the way it is. Yeah. And to me, that's most probably an answer not from truth, but from trying to avoid human connection. Sometimes that answer could be from truth, and that could be really beautiful. So it does, in the end, come back to the particular body mind mechanism but most of the time I would say people saying that is most probably bypassing yeah so yeah I don't know what's your definition of bypassing 
Thank you so much for answering. Pleasure. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, it can be scary when people flip like that. Thanks. Yeah. Dear Lisa, today in your live talk, you mentioned it could help with YouTube if we viewers might leave a comment. However, it seems the availability for leaving comments is still disabled. Love to leave a lovely comment if you may enable the comment options. Thank you, sweet Lisa. But yeah, I think you can only leave a comment after the live stream. I think in the live stream, you know, the, the comments I have to have switched off because they're live comments happening you know, at the side. And I don't think you can either comment below the body in the live, but below the talk in the live stream. So, um, yeah, so after the, the, the talk has been published onto YouTube, then comment. Yeah, thank you for um, asking that because that's clarity. Yeah, so if people um, didn't listen to the bit at the beginning and fast forwarded it, I was saying that it would be really appreciative if you want to support this video. The best thing you can do is subscribe to the channel, like the video and comment. That's a great way to support, you know. You can also donate if you want to, but, um, uh, you know, if that's not possible or you don't want to or, you know, all different types of reasons. And I never really asked for that. But, um, you know, another support is that. Yeah. Is the sense of doership just a thought that masquerades as an individual? Yes. And then the thought always comes with feelings. So the doership comes with a feeling of me doing. It's like a feeling of me in here that is experiencing this life and doing the actions. <laughs> And if anyone wants to ask a question in um, Zoom, you may raise your hand and I will unmute you. There's some people in Zoom. Yeah, but I think that might be the end of the questions for today. Maybe you do a bit of more reading of Nisargadatta. Although I so enjoy them sitting in silence, so maybe there's a bit of silent sitting. Sitting silent. My view outside this window is just so spectacular. Trees are such mysterious things. Communicate under the ground with each other. Isn't that amazing? They grow from everything that falls into the ground around them. I mean, oneness is really reflected back by this change you know in the flow of things because change is always changing into itself like a kaleidoscope as colors change the patterns change the appearances change but it's always the same colors just being rotated in different formations to create different patterns life is really reflecting that back I'm looking at this blue sky with white clouds coming in. Trees of all different sizes waving in the wind. And all of it is at one point or another moving into the other. So the trees are once the wind. 
und the sky, und the clouds, und the soil, and the clouds, und the trees, und the ground, und the wind. It's all exchangeable, you know, and the same with us. We were once the earth, once the trees, once the dogs, the bees, the other people, the light, the sky, the stardust. We have been it all. I'm talking about these bodies, not as consciousness and this apparent flow of things. You know, the atoms that make up this body have been all different formations creating all different things, constantly dissolving and changing into something else. I think every seven years, these bodies are regenerated completely afresh. So it changes and changes and changes. So seven years later, it's no longer got anything in it that looks the same seven years ago and yet you look at a photo and it looks the same it's so different but if we take the way that like just when this body dies it then goes into other things constant movement and expansion endlessly and that's only an issue for the human mind. It's not an issue for life itself. For the human mind, when it's looking at life through me, how can I be special? Time, my life, the meaning to my life, then that can seem banal, like um, pointless. Like, why would I endlessly be changing into things? Because the person looks like it's got this 80 years to put an impression on the planet and make something of itself and be something. And then it's like, boom, like a rocket. I'm going to be something and it runs off into this world trying to be something and win the game. So then when it thinks about its own infinity, it can kind of get depressed because the point to its game is having a limited amount of time to be the most successful, most brilliant and better than everyone else. And then if you look at the infinity of everything, that timer on the game of your life becomes irrelevant. And then all what the person's been working for becomes in question. Why, why, why? Because I've got to be something. But what if you've not got to be something? And there's just the going back to what you are, which is being for nothing and that is absolute love to the person that wants to be something that is just the worst message the person that wants to be something wants to be something it wants to be important it wants to be remembered it wants to make a mark it wants to stamp something it wants to be better than it wants to have a particular life and then as it begins to get in its 50s and 60s it's disappointed and ruminates over its past and where it went wrong because it didn't have the life in which it thinks it should have had but it's had absolute perfection just like the trees the tree isn't worrying about its meaning and its point and it should have grown in, into an oak tree rather than into um, an apple so why am I so small just produce these fat apples whereas they've got slim little acorns and very tall oak with big big fat trunk i've got a skinny trunk it's a little bit nimble looking with bumps and bit, 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 bit. but it's absolutely perfect you are perfection acting out the mind though the identification will never believe this because it needs the belief to exist to be something it needs in order to exist it needs to believe that it's going to be something better than it is now and without that it's crushing 
and the person often flops into depression. There is nothing you need to be. This is it, baby. Recently, I watched a podcast with a famous controversial TV presenter who shall remain nameless. 
where the concept of spiritual warfare was discussed. So we are all puppet, puppets of malicious or benign entities living in spiritual plane that are at war with each other using humanity to act through. As I type this, I realize how ridiculous it sounds. But what are your thoughts on this supposed spiritual warfare that is apparently happening at this moment? Sounds like BS, I M O, in my opinion. The nature of reality is infinite, infinite expressions and infinite possibilities, which is more than we, me or you, can ever think about. We can't grapple with that, we can't grasp that, we can't interpret that. Things are happening here that our mind has no idea about. And safety isn't found in that, isn't found in spiritual warfare or this dimension or that dimension or planes of um, or entities living in spiritual planes. Well, in the flow of things there's never freedom it's endless, it's infinite so what is it that's free in every moment this is grace to recognize this coming out of the tumbleweed of existence the never ending tumbleweed of existence or washing machine I mean, imagine if you tried to explain what happens on planet Earth between Ukraine and Russia and China and US and our civilization, it would sound like ridiculous BS. I'm not saying what you say is true. I'm not validating it. I'm just trying to move away from thought from this world what is it prior to you to them to happenings to life what is the freedom right now this is grace Okay, on that note, we can finish. What a beautiful word to finish on, grace. Yeah. So a couple of things before I leave. Um, it's hard to speak about this after. There's such expansion of nothing happening. Um, Uh, yeah, if you want to um, join the retreat in October, walking retreat, then you have to sign up before beginning of June, otherwise it's going to be cancelled if there's not enough people. Um, and... Um, uh, if you want to support this video please give it the thumbs up subscribe and leave a comment even if it's just a heart or something below 
be so appreciative appreciative yeah and then finally sometimes a few people ask why i say i wish you everything it's the same with the book for the love of everything it's like for the love of nothing doesn't really work so i wish you nothing doesn't really work but by saying everything by saying for the love of everything or by saying i wish you everything I'm wishing you no thing, by default. If you have everything, you have nothing. So I wish you not one or two or three things for every goddamn thing. Oh, I can stop it from here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Das ist alles.